Today is Monday the 11th, 2019. It's an important day in Greece. Today is a public holiday. It's called Kathari Deftera, which means clean Monday, or a really cathartic Monday. Um, Kathari is the root word of catharsis, which implies purgation. It implies cleanliness and rejuvenation in some respects. Uh, the English word is a Shrove Monday or Shrive Monday. Shrive is from the German Schrief, uh, it means to write. In essence, it means writing down all your sins. It's a confessional time, a time for renunciation and a time for atonement. The time uh, is leading into Lent and it's the 40 days before Easter. So the rebirth, uh, the spring festival, in other words, is all about uh, this time. This is the last day of carnival, so this is the last day of binging, and I must say that I'm really pleased about that because I haven't got much sleep. Uh, the, the noise uh, has just been deafening, this beat of the music, all until the break of day for the past few days. Um, fireworks and, and costumes, it's... Um, it's an amazing festival, uh, but it's all the sins, uh, big blowout uh, before the austerity of Lent. And this is really relevant to, to what I'm talking about uh, today, and that's those awful, awful five stages of grief. So, now, why it's relevant is, uh, if you have come to the uh, the great, uh, here's a, a Greek word for you, um, anagnoresis. Anagnoresis is, is the moment of realization of really a, the protagonist in a tragedy, um, particularly a Greek tragedy, uh, when they realize particularly that they are screwed. So very apropos to where we are today, if you have finally come to the conclusion that you are a realist and there's no escape. Uh, there is an imminent and abrupt climate change event coming that will probably lead to human extinction. And once you've, you've got that, then really you enter this grief period. So now the narrative of this Abda, uh, this uh, um, or Dabda, rather, is our cultural go-to point for the stages of grief. It came from uh, a, a psychiatrist called Kubler-Ross, and she uh, was just studying how people really coped with death and the news of something like a terminal diagnosis, kind of what our whole species has got now, and then uh, she came up with these five stages of grief. Now, this is truly, truly awful, awful narrative. Um, and there are a number of reasons why. First of all, it's too linear. So the Dabda thing you go through, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally, acceptance. Okay, it's too neat, it's too compartmentalized, and it's far too linear. You will go through basically washing machine cycles of dabda. So it's really cruel to tell people that it's just this linear slide into limbo and then annihilation. Um, that's the first thing that's wrong with it and to be fair to Kubler-Russ, she did come out later and say that she regretted coming out with these five stages of grief because they were, she did specify them as two packets, packetized and, and linear. And really what she said was she was just trying to describe the coping mechanisms that people came up with to cope with their, their death anxiety and their grief. Um, yeah, that's fine, but uh, as usual, the people that are worst at psychology is psychologists and it's very obvious that it would be made linear that her her theory would be co-opted to be exactly what it is now and a theory that basically is a narrative for slaves wage slaves like you so what they the narrative is trying to present to you is that life 
is an interminable treadmill. It's a, you have to labor, 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 labor. That's the only way to stay alive. And if you fall off the treadmill, it's just a slippery slope, a slide down to acceptance. Just bonk, 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 bonk through these stages to acceptance. And it's very important that you buy into that narrative. It's very important for the plantation, for this whole labor camp that is uh, America, the Western world, civilization, just one giant labor camp and you're a wage slave in it. To keep this labor camp going, it's very important that your exit follows that narrative. I want to break that narrative with you, particularly this part which runs by the name of acceptance. Now, Kubler-Ross really was just describing what people came up with as a coping strategy and it was natural that they would uh, start off with shock and denial and then go into uh, anger and bargaining stages. Um, that was all kind of, uh, because our culture doesn't have a script, that was a natural script for people to improvise on their own and she just was in some sense reporting that. Now there is another script for how you are supposed to die nobly uh, that has been expunged from our culture because it is a slave culture. Uh, and the important things for slaves not to realize is if you fall off the treadmill, there must be no hint that anything good comes from that. The worst thing of all is if you fall off the treadmill, somebody falls off and then reports back to all his fellows or her fellows on the treadmill that it's great fall off the treadmill the treadmill is crap if you you know get to the uh, chestnut tree cafe it's a fantastic time it's uh, you know break the treadmill make yourself free uh, that is the worst narrative for the establishment so they love the idea that you buy into this uh, just slide into limbo which is the waiting room of bleak dark somber place which is one of the circles of hell you know according to to dante is, a, is the limbo state just waiting in the antechamber for oblivion um, it cannot death row hospice any end of life scenario cannot be cheerful in the slave narrative uh, and it's very important to keep slaves slaves so uh, what is the forbidden narrative that really has been expunged, almost excised, like Newspeak, uh, 1984, George Orwell Newspeak, where you have all the vocabulary of the end-of-life hospice scenario excised, so that uh, it's, it just seems like a very negative place to be in and really something to be avoided at all costs so it keeps you running on that old treadmill and keeps you going in the vast labor camp uh, which we so adore and call civilization. So part of this narrative uh, that's been lost is a rich vocabulary of things like catharsis. The very word today of cathari, catharsis is one of the forbidden stages after acceptance. You never really get this linear slide down this progression to final acceptance. It's just a huge myth. Uh, what the, the establishment needs you to buy in to uh, really a narrative where you, in your exit, are, in, in essence, they've used you up. They've used all the life force you've had. They've used the time, the energy, uh, anything that... Uh, they've used up every last drop of essence that you have as a human being. And as psychopaths and managers of the system, they've sucked it all up for themselves. So they've stolen your life for, from you. Now, when you get to your end of life and you become like on Animal Farm, you, you know have to be sent to the knacker's yard if you're the old horse then when you put out to pasture pasture has to be some place that's horrid and to be avoided not only that but in essence they sending you off to the glue factory it's basically the gas chamber so it's very necessary also for the elites the elite psychopaths uh, for you to legitimize 
the fact that they've stolen your whole life from you. Now, on a very large scale, they've stolen life from every living thing on this planet. Our leaders, uh, all these psychopathic billionaires, um, these uh, people that have controlled the system for 8,000 years, church and state, the good cop and the bad cop, it's very important for them that you legitimize your slavery and their theft by going meekly and complicitly into the gas chamber. If you fight or object in those final moments, you delegitimize the fact that they stole your life and the life of every species now probably on the planet. So we are now at the stage, the end game, where all of us in essence will be put into death camps. Uh, literal death camps in terms of There'll be FEMA death camps, there'll be DHS death camps, there'll be ICE death, camp, death camps. Uh, you, you are probably in a death camp already in some cubicle hell in a corporate workplace. Um, it's, it's really a cell, uh, and the way these psychopaths work is with cells. You then incarcerate people in cells. The very word cell, the, the cell for, uh, say, an organism... Um, uh, uh, say a bodily cell that comes from the first people that observed them under microscopes they thought that they looked like cells of monks the monks of course were enslaved by the church and they took vows of poverty and chastity basically so the church could have all the loot so now a cell is really just a big square all these camps are really frames um, boxes and so there's the narrative of this slide into acceptance of your death chamber. So the uh, the five stages of grief then are little boxes uh, and then they enclose your whole annihilation in, in a nice little neat package, a box. So this box theme comes up again and again and again and I've blamed it really on this intellectualizing part, the inner psychopath what I've called the alien cortex, really mostly on your left brain, just a thin core on the outer rim, the bark cortex, means bark, uh, the outer cortex of your brain in essence, the, the last part to evolve and the part that is the lawyer inside you and the quintessential psychopath that suppresses all the other layers so that uh, clinical uh, psychiatrists can see in psychopaths that they have diminished function in the normal human parts and in the parts that are more primate and um, in reptilian, mammalian, uh, the more fish-like parts of your brain. They, they have those parts really suppressed by this outer layer and now, the what we've done as a, as a culture is we've glorified this. We've glorified psychopathy and the suppression of the lower layers, uh, particularly because um, it promotes domestication, it promotes infantilization, uh, anything to do with docility uh, so that you can be found in really this big labor camp, and this labor camp is a big square, a frame in essence, a big box. Now, the people have said before and observed that uh, civilization has comes when they, they lock up the food. In essence, what civilization is, you could say, is you just get all the grains, all the grasses, and you put them in a box. You put them in a frame. And you get all the labor you, the wage slaves, me, all these people that are going to be exploited, and you put them in the box. So the animals go in a box, the grains go in a box, that's corn, wheat, and rice, the grasses, and the labor goes in a box. And hooray! That's what civilization is. Now, when you come to the end of life for one of these wage slaves, there's a problem. Not only for the fact that they need you to legitimize their authority and your slavery. In other words, you have to go willingly, without protest, um, to your gas chamber. Uh, this is problematic. Really problematic for the establishment. And uh, 
it's very important that you you go quietly into into the night and uh, don't object. So there's a poem um, here that I would uh, that's that's very relevant um, to this, and it's T. S. Eliot's uh, The Hollow Man. So it's very important that when you a husk you husk of a human left after they've taken, they've taxed you to death, they've put stress on you to make their projects, uh, to meet their project deadlines, they've kept you under the clock, and they've kept you really cranking in this mechanical way, in this mechanical system. The essence of of civilization is, is this extreme tedium, uh, this, um, this boredom, this man, mundane... Um, uh, really, it's almost like root canal therapy. It's like waiting in a in a dentist chair almost. Um, they they hide that from you. When you're taught in school to think of civilization as uh, Michelangelo's David and uh, all these wonderful things like writing, good grief, um, and uh, really to to glorify your your slavery, uh, all these little things like you know accomplishments in medicine and getting to the moon and uh, flight and all these things which now in total have wiped out our species. So you can see that it's all a lie and it's all bunk. You can see that now just as soon as you're a realist. But for the average person that's pre-realist, they still taught to glorify civilization and glorify the incarceration. And so T.S. Eliot was really writing about that when he wrote the, the Hollow Men. And uh, the, the key part that everybody remembers about the Hollow Men is that the final line, it says, This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And it's, that's part of what I'm talking about, that it's really important for the establishment that you go to your death, uh, you finally snuffed out uh, with a whimper. So... There's a crucial line in this um, in the in the poem that says, "Those who have crossed with direct eyes, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men." And yeah, as we sit here staring down apocalypse, yeah, we're pretty much all stuffed, as T. S. Eliot <laughs> observes. Now, the forbidden narrative. The one that you are not supposed to know about is if you expand that acceptance at the end of the five stages of grief in the ancient times, particularly in ancient Greece, there's a whole lexicon, there's a whole script for the noble death that we've lost. And then people like Kubler-Ross have just come out and said, this is what happens when slaves imp improvise. So when slaves get that, their final terminal diagnosis, they improvise a script that looks like these five stages and they linear slide into slave limbo and then you go quietly into the gas chamber. Uh, now, there's a, another more heroic uh, death at that point and there are a lot of words to recover. One of them is um, catharsis. Uh, and catharsis uh, was really something that Aristotle mentioned in terms of tragedy, in terms, of, and of course, this whole life, and this whole civilization, this whole end of species, uh, climate trauma that we're about to go through is obviously a tragedy. It's a worthwhile tragedy, and Aristotle analyzed one of the essence of tragedies and that was basically they they explain so this is apocalypse apocalypse means removing of the veil it means revelation it means the whole game is explained um, apocalypse really means the revelation of the the heavenly behind the scenes metaphysical that was going on that explains the grim reality that you've lived your wage slavery for example and so in a time of apocalypse, this is when you remove the veil and get to see the mechanism behind uh, this tragedy. It's all, of course, psychology. And what Aristotle realized was a big part of that was catharsis, uh, to expunge this whole rotten system from your being. Now, he mentioned that 
part of catharsis was two things. There was the removal of pity and fear, which may sound strange to you, but what he's really saying is pity is really the mammalian part of your brain, the nice, agreeable part, the uh, cuddly oxytocin fueled part and it's saying compassion you get rid of that mammalian kind of compassion the dominance by your mammalian brain particularly for for women Uh, and then the pity that's the pity side fear is really the burning up of the uh, passions the violent emotions sexual emotions the reptilian part of your brain so you know the you know the four f's um uh, you know, feeding, a fight and flight, and fornication. Uh, so those those are the four F's of your reptilian brain. And Aristotle was saying you you burn all those parts off, uh, all the passions are gone, and then that leads you into a state where you are ready for a triumphant death. And then it's not a miserable death at all. In fact, it's the opposite, and that's ataraxia. So ataraxia very hard to explain but it's really imagine sanity a clean mind uh, passionless um, really you know that there's no other options but you go heroically defiant to your end now compare that to going to the gas chambers like most of the people who went to the gas chambers in Auschwitz and Dachau and the death camps in Poland now you will be facing stuff like that certainly in America and Britain Britain's way overpopulated that's the only way they're going to be able to handle this but you don't want to be in a, on an island like Britain or Japan or something when um, when the shit hits the fan on the with climate change um, you know forget Brexit uh, Theresa May should be planning for where Britons uh, are able to take refuge say northern canada russia they should be negotiating at this stage for where britons go to not trying to shut off immigration <laughs> any immigrant that goes to britain at the moment needs their head red uh, because um, britain can't feed itself and uh, once the jig is up with this fake financial system uh, certainly there are not going to be any freighters coming with food and uh, you know it f- will be too expensive and Britain's track record in helping immigrants is abysmal so what goes around comes around and uh, yeah uh, Britons will live to see um, it thrown back in their faces the ingratitude for um, hospitality and for helping out refugees uh, because basically Britain is going to be an island of refugees with uh, and there's there's not going to be any uh, refugee assistance or famine relief there are not going to be any ships coming uh, from America to bail Britain out that's certain and uh, and probably that's justice in a lot of ways but anyway let's not get sidetracked by a refugee crisis Uh, suffice to say that you are facing the position where people were in in the death camps in Poland now some of those people as I mentioned before waited all the way up until the final stages uh, when they really the apocalypse came and the scales fell from their eyes they made their realizations like oh there is no God oh yeah well done <laughs> great to figure that out you know 10 yards away from the, the gas chamber um, so uh, in that environment the elites are very very vulnerable now the reason they're vulnerable is uh, because you will be on dead ground it's what's called dead ground what dead ground is is uh, Sun Chu in the art of war he was a a psychopath of gargantuan proportions uh, in China and he wrote the book on war uh, and can't get more psychopathic than that I don't think and he spelled out one of the things that all generals have have known intimately um, can figure out for themselves without Sun Chu but it is you never put your enemy on dead ground what that means is you never put your enemy up against the wall you never put their backs to the wall if you put your backs to the wall then they've got nothing to lose they'll fight to the death and it becomes very very hard to defeat them especially if your own soldiers have options like bugging out because they have plenty of uh, room to retreat behind them so the 
one of the maxims of war is never put the enemy on dead ground. You can put your own soldiers on dead ground. In fact, a lot of Roman generals do it, and it's been done all the way up to, to modern times, where you can burn the bridges behind your army. You get them to cross a barrier like a river, and then you burn the bridges. And what you're saying to them is, now you're on dead ground. Uh, you don't get out of this. You fight to the death. You'll, they'll probably win. It's an all-in gamble, of course, but they'll probably win if they're on dead ground and uh, psychopathic generals have taken advantage of this. Now, if you are headed towards extinction, there are 8 billion people on dead ground. Now, this is terribly, terribly dangerous for the establishment because they will struggle to get... 8 billion people to go to the gas chamber willingly. So, of course, in these camps, they will be giving, they will be doping them up and, uh, you know, with, they'll go far beyond religion and hopism, hopium, you know, selling this uh, kind of, it'll be very, very hard in what's coming to sell people religion and hope. Uh, but they'll certainly be doping them up um, with, uh, you know, common or garden opioids. And uh, really, I mean, I th take for instance, if you're in Britain, the NHS, the final legacy of the NHS, there'll only be um, three medicines on the shelf for you. There'll be an aspirin, there'll be an opioid to, uh, to uh, subdue you, and then there'll be forever pills, basically um, never wake up pills, cyanide tablets, uh, and those will be the three things that that'll be the uh, the healthcare industry, even in America, that'll be their final gift to humanity, will be those, those three drugs. Um, but the whole point is, for the establishment, is that in the final moments, when you're on dead ground and you've got nothing to lose, you don't turn on the guards that are, are shuffling you towards um, the, the gas chamber. So, in other words, by way of analogy, just imagine uh, in Auschwitz, there are aerial photos of people lining up for the gas chamber. Now, they have very, very few SS guards standing around, and uh, it's the classic collective action problem, is uh, those people marching towards their death, they must be complicit. Otherwise, in the final moments, if they still have some fight in them, they're very likely to turn on the SS guards and rip them to shreds, and they probably won't go to the gas chamber even. Now... Uh, it only works that you can get them into the gas chamber if they are completely defeated. In other words, if they believe there's five stages of grief and they, they have thoroughly given up. So in other words, they're executing themselves in a lot of ways. Um, that's important because it legitimizes their treatment up until that point. It legitimizes their incarceration in a in a in a labor camp, it legitimized the theft of their, their wealth, uh, their time and energy, which the establishment has done. And, uh, but it is a dangerous time because with nothing to lose, the population can and should, in my view, turn on the establishment that put us here. Now, of course, if you go with the pity and the fear um, you don't go through catharsis. This is why it's important that you, for them, that you stop with acceptance and you don't go through catharsis is because you get rid of pity. You put, the, you particularly women will say, oh, but be nice now. You know, we don't want to blame. We don't want to shake fingers at anybody, wag our fingers at anybody. Um, you know, we're going to go nicely to the gas chamber. So that, that, um, that nursy, nursy, nicey, nicey uh, way of euthanizing you is a, an important part of the, the good cop scenario. Um, priests are also taking that role on, saying, you know, oh, you know, this is the rapture and you'll be taken up to heaven and it'll all work out later. And it's all, you know, complete myth, aren't you? Psychopathic God, you wouldn't want to go to heaven after you've gone through Auschwitz. I mean, 
God's obviously a psychopath if he left you in Auschwitz and left you die horribly like that. What kind of a father is he? I wouldn't want to spend eternity with him. You put me down at the right hand of the, the father, I would stab him in the neck at the first opportunity. I mean, I, don't, I can't think of anything worse than spending eternity with a psychopath, especially sitting right next to him at a, at a table. It's, it's like sitting next to Stalin and behaving like those Stalinist generals fighting for their life every minute because of the psychopath Stalin. This is exactly the same as you'd get if you went up to heaven with God. It's a complete nightmare. And of course, people realize that when they, in the final stages, you know, 10 meters away from the, the gas chamber. So then, uh, yeah, the, the priests, the nurses, uh, the good cops, they all pacifying you. Uh, making sure that you don't have any violent urges so that it le- legitimizes their whole game. And then uh, the the violent bullies, the SS, the police with the militarized, um, scary reptilian clothing, um, you know, uh, really is to intimidate you. And then what they're hoping you do is you stand in line and you go, you know, oh, please don't let this happen. Please don't let this happen. I know if I just stick with the rules, I don't be violent. I do what they say. I'll be fine. It's really like the guys on the passengers in uh, flight 993, I think it was, and um, on 911. And they, you know, all the passengers on 911 on those four planes, they're doing exactly what the establishment wants you to do and has trained you to do, to be domesticated, to be docile. Uh, to be infantile and to uh, listen to authority, just be obedient, and so that you can really take you know hundreds of people to their death in 9/11 just with a box cutter. You could never have done that in say the 19th century. They would have torn you apart in the back of that plane. But you, modern day people have been so domesticated and been so entrained for their own death that really the 9/11 hijack has exploited that. They just exploited uh, your domesticity and docility. Of course, the very last plane, Flight 933, um, yeah, they eventually realized they were on dead ground. And so then they did rebel and they did a let's roll and try and attack the cockpit. It didn't help because another psychopath called Dick Cheney shot them down before they got anywhere, but they you know, died in a Pennsylvania field. But the point remains that that what they're hoping you will do is go, uh, if I just obey the rules, I, I've been taught. Uh, don't be violent, obey the rules, everything will be okay. Now the, the SS guards are telling you, you know, you know the rules, obey the rules, and everything will be okay. And you're 100 you're meters away from, from a gas chamber, you know things are not going to be okay, but they keep on telling you this, you know, obey the rules, obey the rules, you know you must obey the rules. And so, you know, most people will do that. They'll obey the rules until it's uh, too late, and they will go quietly into the night as... Uh, um, they'll go out with a whimper instead of a bang, uh, just as T.S. Eliot said. Now, the bang is a, is a global rebellion. Um, why it makes sense to do it is because it fulfills your meaning as a human being. If you go the other way, the ancient Greek way, to uh, catharsis and then all these other forbidden things like the hieros gamos, which I must get on to uh, later, there's a rich vocabulary of this uh, chestnut tree cafe, this acceptance phase, this little box of limbo that you're not supposed to look at, you're not supposed to know about. Now, what's the correct way to view your apocalypse is what I've mentioned before, and that's um, an amusing apocalypse, but way more than an amusing apocalypse, a hilarious apocalypse. That's the fulfillment of meaning. If uh, If you reject your fate as a slave, you name both aspects of God, the good cop, the bad cop, the the matriarchal and patriarchal forms of God. Um, if you if you blame both of them and say, no, that's foul, this whole game is, is a foul, uh, my extinction is illegitimate, uh, then that gives meaning to all our lives as wage slaves, even our ancestors. So not only... Uh, does that delegitimize them? It gives meaning to us and our ancestors if you die uh, with this noble formula that leads to 
it doesn't avoid death, but it leads to a noble death. So you can die with a whimper and be a sheep all your life. I mean, it's it's your if you're all right if you if you want to be the sacrifice. But part of uh, this hilarious apocalypse is sacrifice. Now, what do I mean? Well, let's go through the word hilarious. Hilarious comes from hilaria. It's it's from joy, but hilaria is the ancient rites in. Rome, the religious rites. So what the Hilaria was was the religious rites of Sibylle, who Sibylle well she's the big matriarch. You know you you we got a little off the off the rails uh, in in our culture, and we have this big Christian guy with white beard. Um, he's he's really Father Time. He's Death. Um, you know, guy with a scythe. Uh, that's who Yahweh is. Allah. Uh, <coughs> Jehovah. That's the we've gone a bit patriarchal in our Christian fantasy, um, but the older world knew a similar, very equally od- onerous um, and odious um, matriarch figure who who is uh, Sibylle Ishtar Isis. Uh, she's been withered down to being little Virgin Mary, you know, basically the Holy Ghost. So the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is really. The Holy Ghost is really Mary. Uh, she's she's the goddess. She should be. She used to be in ancient times superior to the patriarchal god Yahweh, um, but Yahweh got a bit overblown. Uh, Yahweh Shiva, all the male aspects, got a bit patriarchal and overblown. And Mary in Christianity got beaten into this tiny little, meek little, inconsequential Madonna figure. But anyway, let's not get too too much. Um, into that, so suffice to say that the matriarchal figure is Sibylle, and in Sibylle's rites in ancient Rome, uh, around about this time, these this time that I mentioned now, not quite now. It's it's really on the vernal equinox that her rites started. Basically, the fifteenth of March. It's only the eleventh today. So her rites started on the equinox. They basically the spring story, the story of Persephone taken to Hades. Um, and uh, you know, Zeus, Deus, God, the patriarchal God, allowed Persephone to be taken down to Hades and raped. Essentially, that's you, the, the wage slave. Uh, God allowed you to be taken into a cubicle hell, or into a factory, or into an army, and basically used as fodder, uh, raped, in other words, uh, like Persephone was in in Hades, and then this is the time of spring where she's resurrected. The Christian cult is uh, St. Paul's cult is also based on this resurrection. It's uh, although biblical st- scholars absolutely loathe you talking about it. It's it's true. It's it's Attis. So Attis and Sibylle. Attis is um, Sibylle's consort, and Attis is her son and lover. So Attis is really Jesus. But anyway, you. We'll we'll get on to that later, and scholars' hair gets on fire if you say this bit, but it, it is. So then, um, in Sibylle's rites, round about now, in the resurrection rites, uh, called the Hilaria, and we're supposed to have a hilarious apocalypse, uh, Hilaria was the day of joy. So the day of joy is uh, around about the 25th of March, I think. There is a day before that, and that's the day of blood. So you can't have the day of joy without sacrifice, the day of blood. Now, the question is, who gets sacrificed? Up to now, it's always been the weak ones, us, the meek, at the bottom of the pyramid. A true fulfillment of our destiny and meaning to to all our ancestors is if we do, if we flip this over, if we do the impossible, we sacrifice God. We sacrifice the matriarch, the patriarch, represented by our pathological leaders, uh, the generals, the presidents, uh, all these academics, all these people that are supposedly leaders. We've we've glorified them as leaders. Leaders is. They will sacrifice us. They'll put us in the gas chamber as a sacrifice uh, to stave off and legitimize their crime. The alternative is to sacrifice them. 
So the ultimate uh, Prophe Promethean fulfillment of our destiny is to finally turn around in the apocalypse and put them on the altar. Sacrifice them. So what happens in the collapse of civilizations, if you look through the Inca, the Aztec, the Olmec, they, as they collapse, they start putting the weak, children, um, women, uh, on the altar as a sacrifice to this impending doom. Now, it's just basic psychology that the psychopaths in charge of us, um, you know, presidents, prime ministers, Nobel Prize laureates, they'll be doing exactly the same thing to us. They will f s start sacrificing us and then carry on sacrificing us at an ever more furious rate as climate apocalypse um, gets closer and more severe as the four horsemen start to chew up humanity in this time. Uh, they'll have a very ignoble mass sacrifice of us, the people. We, if we allow it, we will wind up in this meaningless annihilation, this meaningless holocaust. All the suffering of the last 8,000 years is only made meaningful in, if in the final instance we turn around and we say, no, Jacques, that I will not go quietly into that night. I will not go out with a whimper. I will go out with a bang. And that bang is the day of blood that, pre, uh, that precedes the hilaria. The hilaria then is the day of joy and celebration. And then there are other things, uh, also uh, a feast um, and the Harris Gamos, and I'll get to all of that. But then that leads to ataraxia, which is really, in essence, every last bit of psychology, every last bit of emotion, every hope, dream, everything you've had, everything you've loved, every tiny bit of what you are will be burnt off. And uh, what will remain is nothing but this person with a clean mind standing against impossible odds in a last stand, an impossible last stand against the consequences of our actions, which is apocalyptic climate change. So, I hope some of this made sense to you. I think it's too much to land in your lap as a lay slave um, all in one go. So it needs to be teased out uh, a little more and expanded upon. But this is kind of the second expansion and more full expansion on uh, the meaning to life after this abominable, horrid narrative of the five stages of grief. The five stages of grief uh, really just get you to the state where you're beginning the game. So the, the, the game starts when the five stages of grief, they, which is so bollocks and linear, uh, but think of that as the beginning, not the end. So this is not the end, this is not even the beginning of the end. But perhaps it might be the end of the beginning. And that's what the five stages of grief are. They will come back to you. They will come in a washing machine on a spin cycle over and over again, right up until your final stand. Um, and yes, uh, ataraxia, think of it like the ancient Greeks standing at Thermopylae. They were facing... Xerxes' army, essentially millions of soldiers. They were, they were, so they tell of a million soldiers facing seven thousand Greeks, maybe three thousand um, Hippolyte warriors. They make a last stand at the pass. It's a pointless stand. There's, they can't make a dent in the Persian army. The Persian army is coming out for revenge after the, the, um, the first Greek war um, against Persia. And there is nothing. They can't run, they can't save themselves, but they go down fighting and fighting on dead ground with such severity that by the time Xerxes got through them, 
he had real pause uh, to think that he was making a big mistake, which he was. Uh, but really, it's the first sign that, that what those soldiers of Thermopylae were saying was they were delegitimizing the tyranny of Xerxes. So if you go quietly into the night, you have legitimized all the wrongs that have been done for 8,000 years or more. And so that's why I say it's not the time to wallow in depression. It's not the time to wallow in acceptance. Uh, it's the time to find your metal and to find uh, what it means to be Perseus and more than steal fire from the gods, steal righteousness, steal courage and steal consciousness from the psychopaths. And that's what it means to get beyond these horrid, horrid five stages of grief. <laughs>